Welcome. Uh, I am going to give a talk on the socio-technical path to high-performing teams. Uh, subtitle, Observability and the Glorious Future. My name is Charity. I go by Mipsy Tipsy on Twitter. Uh, it was my EverQuest monk's name once upon a time. Uh, I am an operations engineer. I am the co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb.io co and the co-writer of uh, Database Reliability Engineering. Fun fact, if you've bought this book and you may notice that yours has a horse on the cover and that one there has a unicorn on the cover, uh, your horse can be fixed by emailing me your address and I will send you a sticker turn said you apparently O'Reilly won't let you have myth, mystical creatures as your spirit animal so I made one uh, honeycomb is a is a company that is doing next generation observability tooling but I promise nothing in this talk is a sales pitch so let's start with teams let's start at the very beginning what are teams um, seems very basic well Teams are small groups of people, typically three to ten, who work together for a common goal. Uh, teams exist to build and maintain things uh, that are too big for one person to deliver or support or maintain. I also like to think of teams as kind of an abstraction, um, the interface for the rest of the company to think about how work gets done. Right? Like you don't want to have to worry about, you know, is the entire company roadmap going to get um, thrown off course because one person in marketing is going on vacation that would be terrible you don't have to pay attention to that because there's a team uh, or if somebody leaves and someone joins right I, I like to think of teams as like raid for humans right it's the job of the team internally to take care of uh, redundancy and resiliency and load balancing and making sure that you know there's no if nobody gets nobody can get hit by a bus and be a single point of failure for information um, and I feel like teams are, are, we're such an individualistic society that we sort of consistently undervalue the skill set of being a good teammate. We underestimate how important and how interesting and challenging and rare they are. Uh, so that's kind of what I, want, what I want to talk about. Teams uh, provide a framework for all these things in addition to being a nice scaffolding for the growth and development of each individual. It's kind of like a peer group for mentoring and, and personal development. Team. And like, here's the outline of the, it's, it's a rough outline and I wanted to state it up front because I do jump around a fair amount to various technical and social and interpersonal and personal like pet peeves honestly there, there's a lot of things that I want to cover but it it really f focuses on why the team is so important how we measure and define a team's performance what it means to be high performing in this day and age what observability driven development means and how you can construct feedback loops and um, a model of soft ownership over the full software life cycle to improve your team's performance and kind of just like closing the socio-technical loop a little bit of brainstorming about the future more I think things are going so we, had, we started with the team now let's start with the person right person you engineer you probably have lots of primary goals of your own that are very unique to you. You want to be a principal engineer, maybe, or you want to be an expert in non-relational databases, if you're crazy. You want to build products that people love. You want to be a team leader, a manager, whatever. Whatever your goals are, like one thing is probably true. If you want to build anything of in interest, <laughs> anything interesting, uh, you can't get there on your own. Uh, you might be an amazing engineer, but what does that even mean if you can't function on a team? Like it's kind of meaningless like the algorithms and data structures in your brain are ne necessary but insufficient qualification for being a good engineer so much of it is actually your surroundings and if you and if you don't have the right team with the right set of values culture like compatible communication styles you may experience anything from just a stunted career growth to a living nightmare like your life might be very difficult very lonely uh, 
getting the right career, um, getting the right team early in your career can really help set a trajectory so that you know for the rest of your career what a good team feels like and, and you can hold your other teams up to, up, up to the bar that's been set. Um, I, I'll just say that like uh, the teams you join will define your career more than anything by a long shot. <laughs> uh, I often talk to people who are thinking about changing their jobs and when I ask them what they want or what they're looking for, you know, I hear a long list of technologies, good work-life balance, you know, community culture, opportunities, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, I'm looking for a high-performing team. Um, but even more than your own personal skill level or, or ability, I think the teams that you join will define you, if for no other reason that, than that you will so rapidly rise to meet the skill level of the teams that you join. I feel like I won the lottery a little bit when it comes to my early career. Right, right out of college, I went to Linden Lab for five and a half years, and talk about a high bar. Like that team set, we were working on cutting edge technology, we had passionate users, um, some of the most brilliant people that I've ever gotten to work with. And it was a very like nurturing and warm and generous set of people. And, you know, Christine and I, in the early days of Honeycomb, we used to say to each other, we've been so lucky. Like I know so many people who are amazing engineers who have never experienced this and they don't like they, they, they're kind of walled off from, from, from their jobs because they feel like this is the best it can be, you know, and we would just say to each other, you know, if we can just provide with Honeycomb, if we can just give people the experience we had where we don't want to settle for the rest of our careers, like that will be, that will make it worth doing. I feel very strongly about this. So after Linden, I had a series of shitty jobs. <laughs> and I'm not going to like shit talk whatever, uh, they were shitty in a large, in a, in a bunch of very different ways, right? Like in ways that, you know, some of them bore, they, they're like non-overlapping sets, right? They were very different from each other. Uh, but the way they made me feel was the same. I was not that invested. Like the only time in my life that I've ever seriously gotten close to being burned out was when I was working for jobs where um, I didn't, trust them where I thought the world was a better place if the product was down uh, if oh, or honestly one place that wonderful people walking distance to work but I spent my days basically translating Google documents on how to set up software into puppet recipes I could only motivate to work for like an hour a day and they thought I was amazing and that was the most demotivating thing that I've ever experienced in my life if you read like any of the research on what makes what we want out of work, like Daniel Pink says, we want autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, your work, I believe that your work can and should be a creative force in your life that you hunger for, that you miss when you're on vacation. Something, a mission that is worthy of investing your life force into. And if you think that that bar is too high, Maybe you haven't had good enough jobs. <laughs> Maybe you should quit and go find another one. Just a thought. Anyway, moving on. Um, kind, inclusive coworkers and a great work-life balance are great. But honestly, that's not enough, right? A high-performing team isn't just fun to be on. They perform. Like, they challenge you. And this is kind of like, you know, once you've reached a certain level of achievement, it becomes easier and easier to hit that level because so many things are, they seem automatic or they, they are not, you know, they're not explicit, they're implicit. And it can be very difficult to unpack exactly what makes a high performing team. I mean, if you think of the tens of thousands of engineering years that have gone into evolving the current set of best practices, it becomes very clear it's not something we should take for granted. But how well does your team perform? Like, what does that even mean? Uh, up until pretty recently, all the answers to this question were bullshit. <laughs> uh, thankfully, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humboldt, Jim Kim have spent the last few years producing these yearly State of the DevOps reports, the DORA reports, and Accelerate. And if you haven't read them, oh my God, you should go spend some quality time with them, like, right now. Uh, because they basically have done all of this research and science, and, and they show that you can boil down how high-performing a team is to basically four things. 
four key metrics that every engineering manager should really be tracking week over week. And these metrics are, how frequently do you deploy? How long does it take for your code to go live after you've written it? How many of your deploys fail? And how long does it take you to recover from an outage? I would add, I would add personally, I think every engineering manager should be tracking this. How often are you paged outside of work hours? Because this, you know, it's, it's a measure of, of your humans. Um, it's, it's a measure of how much it's impacting your humans' ability to sleep and how much they have to plan their life around work. This should be low. This should be a low, low number. At Honeycomb, uh, I get upset if this is about, if this be, becomes more than twice a year for people. And people think that that's insane and that's not a reasonable metric, but it is. We'll get to that. There is, spoiler alert, there is a wide gap between the high-performing teams in the world and the bottom half. And no matter how wide you think it is, it's probably wider than you realize. Um, deployment frequency for low to medium, which is the bottom 50%. It's once per week to once per month. That's how often they can ship code. Uh, and elite teams, I kind of hate the term elite. I kind of prefer excellent, but whatever. I'll use their term. On demand, multiple deploys per day. Not a big deal. You want to deploy, you can have a deploy, right? Uh, lead time for changes. <laughs> Less than an hour versus one to six months. Time to restore service. Less than an hour, right? Less than a day. Change failure rate, right? <laughs> over half or less than 15%. And interesting, fascinatingly, if you look at like here are the numbers for 2018 versus 2019, that gap is growing. The gap is growing and you can see that like the quote unquote elites, um, there are more and more of them, like more and more people are catching on to this. It's, it's like an accelerating feedback. It's a cycle of itself. You get hooked on it, honest to God. Like once you realize you can make those numbers go up and you realize that you have some control over it, uh, they go up pretty fast. Um, and yet half of our cohort, half of our fellow workers um, are losing ground, if anything. And people think that this has something to do with your good engineering, you're a good engineer or not. And I swear to God, it, it is not. <laughs> it really isn't. Uh, you can take someone out of Google and put them in, you know, a medium performing team, and suddenly they become a medium performer. Take someone out of the medium team and put them in elite, in an elite team, and they become an elite performer. This is like 80 to 90 percent your context and your surrounding, all of the processes, all of the um, the interpersonal stuff, all of the practices, all of the the, the tool set that is supporting you, uh, it's not how good you are at data structures, which is kind of terrifying, isn't it? To realize that much is out of your control. And that's not all. Uh, it gets worse actually, because then the Stripe developer report went and surveyed all these developers and showed that almost half of our work week we spend doing bullshit. Like stuff that does not move the business forward, that is not learning, that is not interesting. It's it's basically doing all of the shit that you're trying to plow through to get to the shit that you have to do, right? It's trying to figure out if you have the right bug or trying to orient yourself in time and space, trying to fix the CICD pipelines, trying to fix someone else's breaking test so that you can get to your own tests. Uh, and this honestly isn't as disturbing to me as the fact that we've just all uh, taken this as normal, that we've just decided this is what it's like to build software. It's fucking not. It is not okay. Like, it is not okay for half of your life at work to be spent doing shit that's basically pointless, that shouldn't have to be done. And it's not okay that we just accept this. God, the biggest obstacle that we face at Honeycomb is just convincing people that there a better world is possible. That this is not just part and parcel with building software, and B that this is that this belongs to them. <laughs> that they're a good enough engineer that they deserve to have nice things too, right? Uh, it I, it is not about how good of an engineer you are. And in fact, the fa most people <laughs> are 
would become good engineers very quickly if they were in an environment where they were allowed to spend most of their time on learning to become a good engineer instead of waiting through other people's bullshit. It really, 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 really pays off to be on a high-performing team. Like, those are not small numbers. <laughs> 208 times more frequent code deployments. That's every time you ship, you're learning something, right? You're getting that immediate feedback. You're 106 times faster between the amount of time between when you write the code and when it goes live. Until it goes live, you have to keep it in your head, right? Or, or you have to page it back in to fix bugs. I don't remember what I was doing way back then. Like, how long has it been? Two. 1,604 times faster to recover from incidents. That's insane. Like, firefighting is not the time when you are learning to be a great engineer. I'm sorry. That's the time when... <laughs> Imagine how much better of an engineer you would be if you got to start out on a high-performing team and, and work on one for your entire life. Like, that's the magic of starting out at a Google or a Facebook, is they don't let their teams perform at those very low levels, and that's why you grow so much in a very short amount of time. What happens when an engineer from the elite team, <laughs> ask any engineer who's ever left Google, right? There's this cocky air that they come out with, you know, they're just like, we're from Google, like we could, and, and, and the bubble gets popped, like every time, because the speed at which you can deploy and, and build and ship is not defined by you. It's set by the team. Your productivity will rise or fall to match the team that you join. And it takes a lot of work on the team to move that needle. So who's going to be the better engineer in two years? Uh, the person on a high-performing team doing 3,000 deploys per year or the person who gets to deploy five times? I mean, that's a really stark difference. So how do we build high-performing teams? Well, if you ask most people in Silicon Valley, they'll say, well, you just hire the best engineers <laughs> and then you magically get the best teams. Fuck those guys. Oh my God. Even worse are like the VCs who are like, just hire the engineers with the best pedigrees and then you'll get the best teams. No, no, a thousand times no. Um, often you get the people who have never thought about what it takes to build a high-performing team, and they, they're so used to all of it being done for them. Uh, but, like, here's, here's a true fact. Good managers don't hire people. They build teams. They build teams. They grow teams. They curate teams. They craft teams. They spend more time thinking about the needs of the existing team than the candidates themselves, in my experience. Uh, what does your team actually need? What would take it to the next level? What skill set? What fresh eyes? Uh, what, you know, uh, we talk about that for a very long time, but that's not what this is about. Uh, that is bullshit from the fires of hell. <laughs> but how do you build a high-performing team? Well, bring in people who share your team's values and then invest effort into constructing feedback loops, socio-technical feedback loops. Um, the human processes and communication plus the technical tooling um, in order to build out true like ownership over the full software life cycle. And then you instrument, observe, rinse and repeat. I, it's that simple. This is why at Honeycomb, we select heavily for communication skills when we're interviewing. My philosophy has always been, if you can explain to me how you're going to solve the problem, I am sure that you can fucking write the code. <laughs> like, you don't actually, I don't, you know, I, I don't actually need to sit there and watch over your shoulder. I trust that you can do it. And the reverse is not actually necessarily true. There are lots of very good senior engineers out there who can build all, all kinds of things that they can't walk you through and explain the trade-offs, like why they made certain choices, what they might do instead, like how they might, you know, select for different constraints and my belief I can't prove this part but my belief is that those communication skills are a big part of what help the team talk to each other and learn from their mistakes so that they don't keep repeating them but I just threw that big word out there socio-technical so let's look at that um, this is definitely my favorite new word <laughs> I 
And one of the reasons it's my favorite new word is because you automatically know what it means. Like, I don't actually have to explain it. It's pretty obvious. Uh, and something that I think is so fascinating and powerful about socio-technical systems is that the implication is, um, do you want to change people? You can change them by changing the tools that they use. Because when you change the tools they use, you change how they behave, which means you change who they become and who they are. Fascinating. Uh, so this is the, oh, I should put the, I need to credit this to Richard Cook. Oh, no, his redeems right there. This is by Richard Cook. Uh, and and he, he, he's drawn this beautiful graph that shows how your values are the things that are in your, in your head, right? The why, the what. Uh, how should this work? Why is it happening? These these are the things. Um, these are these are the things that correlate to like cognition, your goals, etc., um, your intentions. Uh, and then there are the artifacts, the literal tools, um, you know, your code, um, the artifacts that you're trying to deploy, uh, your databases, etc. And then there's the stuff in the fuzzy middle, uh, the stuff that is you know tools combined with practices uh, and this is this is where the this is where the magic happens I, I feel um, because okay so for example here's here's an example of how our practices uh, our val our values can change our tools over time through our practices what imagine that I I'm an asshole I join a company and I write a script so that every time you write a test or run a test that fails, it emails the entire company. <laughs> Subject line. <laughs> Ian, and Ian or Sam, like, test broke prod. And what if it also paged your manager, day or night? How do you think that would affect the team's velocity and willingness to take risks over time? I'm guessing it would put a severe dent in it, right? These feet feedback loops are usually a little bit more subtle than that, but they're super powerful. And, and additionally, we can start to see how observability is key because if you can't actually see the result of, of the test or, or the, um, the tool usage, then you can't learn from its result. High performing teams have a dual mandate, which is happier customers and happier teams. And anybody who says that they only focus on one half of this is either lying or delusional. Amazon is famously like customers only, um, which is incredibly short-sighted because engineering happiness and the sustainability of your systems are intimately entwined. Uh, systems that are observable, systems that are easier to own and maintain, um, give your engineers less, less bullshit to do, it means less turnover, less time and money spent ramping up new engineers or replacing them. You can run more systems with hum fewer humans. Uh, ultimately, this is about operating your business successfully. Um, but like I said, this work consists of cultivating socio-technical feedback loops so that engineers can own the full life cycle of their code. And this work absolutely should begin with observability. It doesn't have to. I have seen plenty of people try to bolt this on after the fact, but it's incredibly wasteful of your time and your effort and your energy. It's like, like observability is like putting on your glasses before you drive down the fucking highway. And that's generally a good, good idea if you have poor vision, because otherwise you might get to where you're going, but you, you will have wasted a lot on the way there. So I want to start by kind of, I, I've been using this term like feedback loops a lot. Let me show you like an example of a bad feedback loop. Um, engineer merges a diff. Um, hours pass. Other people merge diffs, right? Maybe days pass. Many people have merged diffs. Okay, at some point, at this point, like if, you've, if, you, <laughs> if, if you have like diffs that are manually triggered in this way, um, people probably avoid doing them because it's probably not fun because it's probably very um, prone to being a mess. Eventually, somebody's going to have to trigger a deploy with a bunch of merges. Um, let's say that deploy fails. Uh, let's say that it takes the site down and pages someone. Uh, well, it probably pages on call, who is probably not the person who triggered the deploy. 
they might they might not even know that they're both working on the system, right? Um, the person doing the deploy may not even know that it failed. The person who's on call may not even know that it failed because of a deploy. Uh, so, but the, if the site's down, they probably look, oh, there was a deploy. Let's say they roll back. Uh, and then they just, they're like, okay, well, what the hell happened? Well, here's 20 fucking merges. They might just start get bisecting or they might start doing a get blame or they might start just asking, hey, who's made any changes that could have cost this? Did anybody do any, any database upgrades, right? Uh, that is likely to eat up the rest of her day. Um, as well as any other engineers who had submitted diffs in the meantime, who then get pulled away from whatever they're building. Uh, now, if the original engineer merged that diff days ago, they've probably paged all that context well out of their brain and moved on to other things. So they have to go back and try and figure out what the fuck it was that they were trying to do in the first place. Meanwhile, everybody who's merged has got to go and try and figure out that it was their diff that took the site down. Okay, and now like fast forward to the end of the day, it's taken up everybody's day. For God knows how many engineers, and everybody's sitting around bitching about how on call sucks, and I can't get any work done when I also have to be on call. <laughs> Anybody ever heard this? Yeah. Well, okay. Let's take a look at this feedback loop um, in a in a virtuous feedback loop, right? Where 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 we're where we're catching, where we're seeing and observing and catching uh, and and handling things appropriately. Uh, so engineer merges diff which kicks off an automatic CI, CD, and deploys the artifact. Deploy fails. Oh, no. Still happens, right? Failure still happens. Deploy fails. But we wired it up so that um, it will always page and alert the person who just submitted the deploy that's going out. That's great, right? We've got a very clean, elegant, tight feedback loop, so it, it notifies the engineer. Meanwhile, it's also reverting everything to a safe state. Uh, so the engineer, when they happen to notice, oh shit, my diff didn't succeed. Okay, engineer goes over, couldn't quickly spot the error because he was instrumenting the entire time, right? Um, so he then adds some tests and instrumentation leisurely. Site isn't down, it's up, so you know, takes his time. But it's only been a few minutes, so he still got everything fresh in his mind, so this isn't gonna take very long, and promptly commits a fix. Total time elapsed, 10 minutes. Same fucking problem, same fucking diff, same fucking crash. Um, 10 minutes for one engineer versus, you know, God knows how many engineers for, for, for days. Uh, this doesn't have to be tricky. <laughs> it really doesn't. Um, observability en enables you to, to inspect, like, uh, inspect these things at the origin with all of the rich context of the event, which is what ultimately really enables software engineers to have ownership over the life cycle of their software. Without it, uh, your team, you know, your team is probably gonna get very good at guessing. I don't wanna shortchange them. Like, I got incredibly good at guessing as an ops engineer. I could like walk into, into the room, see everything's down, like dashboards on the wall. I would just eyeball and go, ah, I know, it's Redis. And people be like, what? How'd you know it was Redis? And I'd just be like, I don't know. I can just sense it, right? And I love that shit. It's great to feel like the master of the universe. <laughs> it just doesn't really scale. And it doesn't really, like, nobody else can, like, see into your brain. Nobody has access to your, to your like, library of past outages. And without material evidence, like, you will really struggle to connect these feedback loops. So I haven't really defined observability yet. Um, Let's do that for those of you who haven't been reading Liz and my Twitter feeds for the past few years. Observability, like it's a borrowed term from mechanical engineering and control theory where it's like the mathematical dual of observability is controllability and it means how well can you infer the knowledge of the internal state by looking at it from the outside. Applied to software engineers, it really means can you understand anything that happens to be going on in your systems right now just by asking questions from your tools. Uh, and can you ask new questions, understand any new state, without shipping new code to handle it? Because if you have to ship new code to handle it, that implies that you need to understand it in advance. Um, and here are, if you accept that definition of observability, here are a long list of technical <laughs> details that I'm just going to ask you to take my word for it if you want 
more information. You can see all the other things that I've written. But these just follow from those. These are the necessary characteristics of your observability tool if you accept that definition. Uh, and the last time I ran through this in a dry run, uh, they asked me to give an example so that it would be clear. So let's look at an example of a difference between um, a monitoring system, like the kinds of questions that monitoring systems can ask and answer, and observability. Photos are loading slowly for some people. Why? And this is from like the lamp stack days, right? Probably every single one of us has debugged this kind of problem. And the great thing about like the monolith or the lamp stack, whichever you like to call it, is that like you could build a system, you could basically look at it, eyeball it, guess 80% of the ways it would ever fail, right? And write monitoring checks to handle those things. And you'd figure out the remaining 20% over the next six months of running this, this system, right? So, why? Um, we're out of apps capacity. Uh, or, you know, errors or latency are high. You know, database is slow. We've run out of connection counts, right? Like, all of these things you can monitor for. Great. Cool. Okay, now let's take the same question. Um, only these, act these are actual outages that were taken from Parse and Instagram. Uh, very modern microservices kind of infrastructure. Okay, <laughs> cool. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to monitor for. Like most of these seem to be problems that are happening for the first time, have never happened before, and will probably never happen again. So what exactly thresholds am I supposed to be defining? Right, so let's look at some more. Latency reverts to historical mean on Tuesdays. I know what you're thinking, but it is not a ground drop. <laughs> Uh, we let our users hit themselves in the head. Cool. Like, okay, so these are very, you know, complex, specific questions that, you know, you, you arrive at through iteration and exploration, um, but they've never happened before, and they'll probably never happen again. And again, like, what am I supposed to monitor for? Okay, I've got even more, right? Like, like all of these things are, are super fun to figure out. Uh, Oh, push notifications are down, um, which was fun because I'm like, this is impossible because push runs in a queue, and I'm getting push notifications. Ergo, push can't be down. Well, spoiler alert, um, it, there was one router in, in Eastern Europe that was refusing to let DNS requests fail over from UDP to TCP when the UDP packet size was exceeded because we brought up more capacity. Doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah. Yep. You can see how monitoring just kind of run, runs out of the ability to, to deal with these, these things, right? And why now? Uh, well, because complexity is off the charts, right? Literally every single trend in computers is driving towards more and, you know, ephemeral, dynamic, like <laughs> everything's replicated and distributed and chopped up into... You know, like, and, and it used to be that, say, if you had a 99.9% .9 uptime, then one-tenth of 1% 1 of a time, somebody was getting an error, and it was pretty evenly distributed, right? Well, nowadays, it's just as likely that you've got a 99.9% .9 uptime, and that means that it's 100% up for everybody except for the people whose last names start with S-H-I-E, and it's 100% down for everyone in that chart. Right, and it's going to look exactly the same from the top level unless you have observability and you can do a deep dive into like the details. Yeah, anyway, our tools were built for a monolithic world. They were built for the last generation of infrastructure. Uh, our tools were built, you know, the last, this generation of tools and, you know, the log aggregators and the monitoring tools, the data dogs, everything. They were built to answer questions. They answer questions really well. Um, but first you have to know what the question is, and if you don't know what the question is, you're screwed, and increasingly the kinds of problems that you're having are the ones where, uh, by the time you know what the answer is, you know what the question, by the time you know what the question is, you know what the answer is too, <laughs> and, uh, <sighs> our tools just kind of haven't kept pace, uh, and we have categorically not been good at turning our tools around on ourselves and our processes as they interact with our tools, which means that 
which means that the future is here, but it's just very unevenly distributed. I kind of think of, of the culture of, of, of high-performing teams as being passed around by oral tradition. There's nowhere that you can go to learn it. If you're lucky enough to get to work with somebody who tells you what they learned from, you know, the tribe of, you know, passing this down mouth to mouth, uh, then, then you're lucky, right? But it's not available. It's not generally available to everyone. And that bothers me. We used to be able to reason about our architecture. We used to be able to look at our dashboards and know what was happening. Um, there on the left, you've got the monolithic, you know, lamp stack. Um, in the middle is Parse from 2013. And on the right is the National Electrical Grid. And I really feel like that's the model that you need to have in your mind if you're thinking about modern architectures. It's ephemeral. It's dynamic. It's so complex. You can't predict where the next tree is going to fall over on a street. You shouldn't try. You shouldn't waste your time trying to try, right? It's all about instrumentation so that you have a very ad hoc sort of visibility to dive down deep into wherever the pain pops up or you're screwed. <laughs> no, I'm an optimist. Uh, that's why observability is really the key to making this leap from being a team that knows how to deal with predictable threats and known unknowns uh, to being a team that knows how to deal with the unknown unknowns and can really take ownership over the software lifecycle. The, the fact is that like our software and assistants have now gotten so complex that if you didn't write it, if you didn't build it, you kind of don't have a prayer of being able to operate it, right? Like the wall between dev and ops, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Like you cannot operate a system uh, that you didn't have a hand in developing and you can't really develop the system unless you get to watch it run because production is reality, right? Uh, staging is less and less uh, useful for anything. And this mirrors a shift from known unknowns monitoring to unknown unknowns observability. I think of it as of uh, I think of it as observability driven development, right? It's like TDD, but TDB stops at the border of your laptop, right? Um, TDD just assumes that the system works, <laughs> so you can check if your code works. Uh, that is a mighty big assumption. Uh, observability driven development um, encompasses production in that. And observability driven development practices instrumentation as you're writing your code with an eye to your future self who's going to need to understand it. Observability driven development means that you have muscle memory uh, that remembers that when you merge code, you go and you watch it deploy and you look at it through the lens of the instrumentation that you just wrote and you ask yourself, is it doing what I wanted it to do? And does anything else look weird? And I swear to God, if you do that, <laughs> you'll catch 80 to 90% of all problems before users ever even get a whiff of them, right? But like observability-driven development means that you know that your job is not done as a developer until you've closed that loop, until you've watched it as users are using it in production. You have an observable system when you have a well-understood system. Most people in the world have never had the luxury of working on a well-understood system. It's um, sad but true. Uh, most people are used to working on systems that were <laughs> um, hairballs of shit when they were first shipped and have only we, we've just kept shipping crap that we don't understand onto our systems that we've never understood and they've just gotten worse and worse. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It, it honestly doesn't. Um, the, hardest, the hardest task that I have is trying to convince people that, that they deserve to have nice things and that they belong in a better world, that it isn't just for the developers who are like the 1%. That's not, that's for everyone. It is easier to do it this way than it is to do it the old way. Observability for teams, like, so when Liz Fung Jones and I sat down to like do an observability maturity model, what we realized that we had accidentally done was built a team maturity model uh, because observability is just the how. It's how you do the things that build high-performing teams. And 
we were able to kind of break it down into these five umbrella categories. And I recommend that you go spend some time with the OMM document that we wrote. There's a lot more detail there. Um, but we wrote it, we're hoping that, because like, it's not like I can give you a checklist and go, you can have a high performing team if you check off, you know, these hundred things. It doesn't work that way because I don't know where you're at. I don't know what your specific troubles are. Um, but what I do hope is that you can see yourself in these descriptions, either in the we're struggling with this or we're doing okay at this, so that you know where to invest your effort. Starting with like resiliency to failure, right? If you're doing well, you would rec recognize yourself on the left. If you're doing poorly, you'd recognize yourself on the right. Uh, you know, the high level consequence of, of you're doing poorly is high turnover. It's that you're constantly spending time training new engineers uh, and that people don't want to be on call. They get burned out. It takes a long time to recover. Uh, people dread being on call. If you're doing well, this just isn't an issue. Uh, then there's high quality code. And this, to me, this really, this manifests in confidence. Like, do your developers have confidence in their deploys? Do they think that they can understand a problem if they have one? Um, and even more so, when you have a bug, when you've been assigned a bug to fix, do you believe that you can go and fix that bug? Or do you dread picking up the rock and seeing, like, just how deep it goes? You know, are you accustomed to a world where by fixing one thing, oh, fuck, I have to fix that and that and that and that. And it's just like cascading like issues. Uh, that, that dread that you feel in the pit of your stomach is a sign that this is an area of difficulty. Then there's complexity and technical debt. And I think of high quality code and complexity and technical debt as being the, the software engineering and the infrastructure complementary like they're saying the same thing but one is inside the code and the other is how the components are glued together right um are people afraid to make changes <laughs> the haunted graveyard effect well then this is a problem um but if you're doing all right then your engineers should be able to spend the majority of their time making forward progress on their core business goals predictable releases and, and for most people, this means frequent releases. This is the frequency of deployment. But for some industries like IoT, uh, it's more about the predictability. But for most of us, it is like, is this a barrier? Do I even have to think about it? Do I have to like cordon off times of the year or days of the week where nobody deploy? It's too scary. God knows how long it will take us to recover. Um, then this is an area to invest. And honestly, this is the area that most people should probably start, is just fixing their deploys. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Because it's never seen by any team as uh, product, like, or, or like as, as something that, you know, that they do when, you know, to move the business forward. So it tends to linger and get moldy. And finally, understanding user behavior, by which, like, I think that the important thing about this is that, how to say this, um, tools build silos. The border of, you know, who uses this tool, um, if it stops at your team, if only your team uses this tool, um, then that is a silo. And if each team has its own tool for understanding production, um, then you have, a bunch of silos because like honestly if if you want to like agree on something you're going to spend more time trying to agree on the nature of reality than you are actually talking about the product the production problem that you're trying to collaborate to solve uh it's really really key to have engineers and business people looking at emanations of the same same data if at all possible um there should there shouldn't be like hard lines between them because developers should want to know things about users and, and vice versa. Why are computers hard? Because <laughs> we don't understand them. 
and we keep shipping more shit that we don't understand into the festering hell balls that we've never understood. And quite frankly, um, our tools have never encouraged us to learn how to scientifically, iteratively debug. Vendors have told us, just pay us ten, tens of millions of dollars and you'll never have to understand your systems. We'll just tell you what to look at. That's always going to be a lie. Someone is always at the end of the day. Someone is always going to have to understand your systems. And it's time to change this by embracing it and democratizing this and really paying attention to those socio-technical loops with observability. If you want to spend more of your time moving the business forward, instrument, observe, and iterate on the technology that you're running um, and on your team itself, uh, on, your, on your CICD process. Uh, join teams that honor this work and prioritize it. If you want to join a good team, look for the teams that value junior engineers and consistently invest in their potential. That's a really good sign on many levels. Fundamentally, like the old way of running systems that was based on playbooks and you know lots of documentation where you could just follow a recipe, those days are they're not over, but they're leaving. They're going. <laughs> and increasingly, like with modern systems, they're too complicated. You can't run them off a playbook. They're too complex. Their behaviors are emergent. Um, they're shifting and they require your full creative self to show up to work. Um, you can't just model these systems in your head and in a playbook. If you try, you'll be out competed by teams who have modernized their tooling and their processes. A lot of people feel like, I don't have time to do an observability today, but like later I super will. Uh, that's pretty backwards because everything you do has a consequence, has a result, and if you aren't able to observe it and learn from it, you're just fucking yourself. You really can't afford not to front load this work. Where are we going? Well, on call, like the, 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 pro the ownership of production is increasingly shared by those who write the code, who, who build the software systems. Just like the infrastructure people are increasing the people who also write code and build systems, right? But like the pact that we make, managers and engineers, engineers support the systems, managers, you commit, on call cannot be terrible. It can't be something that is life impacting that you have to plan around. It can't be something that wakes you up, that makes you sleepless. That's not okay. That's not compatible with life. Um, and it's not okay to just like shuffle all that off and onto a poor abused ops team. <laughs> That's not okay either. Um, now that we're bringing it home to software engineers, um, it becomes very apparent how painful that is. Invest in your deploys, instrument everything, democratize ownership, craft and curate feedback loops. Don't be scared by regulations. If your security team tells you this is impossible, um, they're wrong. And in the end, we are very fortunate in this industry. And remember that your labor is a very scarce and precious resource. Um, people are competing for it. People will pay a lot of money for it. Give it to those who are worthy of it. Don't lend your creative life force to people whose missions um, don't make the world a better place, um, who don't invest in their people, who don't have any loyalty to their people. You only get one career and it's yours the shepherd. Nobody's going to do that for you. If there's one piece of advice that I could give anyone, it would be to seek out the high performing teams. Um, let's get better at learning and sharing, you know, <laughs> how to do this well. Um, so that it becomes more standardized and less of a, you know, a secret thing that's whispered and passed around um, person to person. Because the more time you can spend learning and building and moving the business forward, uh, the less time you spend mired in tech debt, shitty wasteful processes, the more powerful you will become and the more you will love your life and your job. You have a very powerful voice in the institutions that you choose to work at. Whether you choose to use it and acknowledge it or not, I recommend that you do. <laughs> use it to advocate for those who don't. Use it to push for equality instead of lording it over the other roles. Engineering is not better or harder or more challenging than any other discipline. It's just more scarce and therefore highly paid. We have a real, I feel like 
so many trends in technology in in you know the art and science of people management uh, in infrastructure like all of these things are converging in ways that open the door for things to be better better for people better for teams um, all we have to do is do it so thank you the end <laughs>